Um, so presumably you are all the survivors. I would assume you're not going to uh, resign from the course after showing up to lecture today. So we're, we're doing this. We're in it for the long haul. Uh, only a few more weeks anyway, so. Uh, the resignation deadline is so late. For, for those of you who aren't aware, the resignation deadline is tonight. Um, if you want to resign the course. We only have one more week of content and then two weeks of review. So it'd be, it'd be a waste to give up now, for sure. Uh, let's see if I'm logged in. I'm not logged in. So you'll just have to take my word for it, I guess. Uh, Piazza, I do have that post that I was talking about last time for what to do for review week. There are three lectures, so there are six lectures total. Three of those lectures are reserved, I suppose, for lack of a better word. One of them is the review week, or the review lecture for LO4. We don't have any room for the LO4 lab. It's LO4 quiz and interview. Next week, LO4 quiz and interview second chance. So there's no lab for LO4 review. So that Monday, I'm going to go over quiz solutions. I'll pick one of the versions of the quiz and then go over the solutions and, uh, and talk about that kind of stuff. So that's one lecture. Another lecture, uh, Paul and I talked about it, and we both really want to talk about classes and OOP in Python, showing you how to take some of these 116 topics and apply it to Python. Because let's be honest, after this class, whenever you have a choice, you're going to choose Python over Scala or some other language over Scala, uh, except when you're forced to. Uh, I know that because in 3.12, I let students choose whatever language they want, and most of them will choose Python. It's just a, a more friendly language to work with, uh, if we're being honest. Uh, so we want to show you how to do that. And in 3.12, when I, students use Python, I'm like, they'll put all of their code in one giant method. I'm like, I spent half of 1.16 showing you about OOP classes and objects and encapsulation and making methods and calling those methods and everything. And like, I don't know how to do that in Python. So <laughs> I don't know if one lecture is going to solve that problem. But I at least want to give you a fighting chance of how to apply these things to, uh, to Python. Uh, Paul and I. is actually Paul's idea, so you can thank him for that. Or blame him if you don't like that idea. And then another lecture that's taught by the TAs, which is going to be what you can do with your computer science degree, it looks like they're landing on. But in general, what you can do in your future, uh, what your CC future holds for you. And uh, they do, we were discussing, and it looks like it was suggest, suggested on the Piazza post for those TAs to also discuss uh, before graduation, like what your future holds, what courses to take, uh, what depth and breadth requirement courses to take. Uh, and with that idea, Paul and I thought it might be a good idea if we were not in the room and the lecture's not recorded so they can be as blunt as they possibly can be <laughs> and uh, tell you things like, which professors they do and don't recommend, things like that. <laughs> so we, we might end up going that route, um, uh, that route for that. If you, but they do plan on talking about careers as well. So if they don't get to that, you know, feel free to make a suggestion on the Piazza post and be like, no, we absolutely have to have that lecture. Maybe that can be one of the other three. Uh, just give the TS2 lectures. So one can be the talk shit about professors lecture and the other can be <laughs> careers in computer science and engineering lecture. Uh, other than that, the other three are up for grabs. It's whatever suggested. We have quite a few suggestions and upvotes on starting a project from scratch. So it looks like that's going to happen, at least one of those lectures. I'll go to IntelliJ, click New, select Project, and just build something from absolute scratch and build something in a lecture. Uh, so that'll be something. And then it's whatever else ends up getting suggested. I forget what else was on there. There were some really good suggestions, though, this, uh, this semester. Uh, so feel free to get in there, make your suggestions, vote on suggestions. I always forget what it's called on Piazza. I think it's good comment, but whatever their version of upvoting is, uh, vote on uh, whatever suggestions that are made that you would like to see. <laughs> yeah, and for the long haul, 11 weeks into the course, I know. It's, it's, the resign, resignation deadline is so late that it's, I don't know, it, it's almost meaningless, I suppose. Um, but... The, for whatever reason, the school wants to give you a long time to decide whether or not you want to resign from a course. So it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Python does have OOP. Uh, it, my 312 students don't seem to realize that, that Python has classes. You do class, class name, you, know, <coughs> you define a class in Python. The syntax is a bit different. So that's what we would focus on in that. That's what we'll focus on in that lecture. Syntax is quite a bit different. So if you're just trying to go in there with the Scala syntax, 
It's not going to work so well for you. Yeah, but it's icky. It's not that bad. Kind of like Python OOP. The one icky part is self. Yeah, the underscore, underscore, in it, underscore, underscore, self. Yeah, I'll agree with that one. Uh, but I like that it. I like that self is explicit. I don't like the underscores. Python in general is icky. Oh no, my Python. <laughs> What's the quickest way to reach to reach me online? Uh, the quickest. I don't know if I want to advertise the quickest way, but email is uh, an effective way. Uh, don't make a. By the way, I, I don't know if any of you do this, but don't make a Piazza post only to me. I, it's almost guaranteed that I won't see it. I don't check Piazza too much. That's pretty much for TAs to answer your questions. So the private post, the instructors, TAs are going to answer that. And then if they can't answer it, they'll ping me on Slack. And then I go in there and I answer that question, which uh, hasn't happened in a while. This far in the semester, the TAs got it covered um, pretty well. But if you need to reach out to me directly, uh, email would probably be the best way. All right. Any questions on anything before we get into this? There's only one more week of content after this. I'm excited. I don't know if you all are excited. I assume you are. I'm sad that more, more people in 312 use OOP now that I've I keep ranting to them about it. <laughs> They're like, fine, I'll use OOP. Or FP. As long as they choose, as long as they have an approach, I, I'm okay with that. S apply some paradigm of software engineering is fine. Um, but when they just choose neither and just have one giant method with all their variables just hanging out all, every, everywhere, um, it gets hard. It, it gets, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it gets hard when they get towards the end of the semester. Because in 312, you build one big program. Each homework builds on the previous one. So by the time they get to the last few homeworks, they just can't do anything. They're completely paralyzed because their code base is 100% unmanageable. Um, and I can't read their code in office hours. The TAs can't read their code in Ooh. office hours. So these principles that we're teaching you now are actually important. They help you in future classes in your entire career. But what we're here to talk about today is this code. We're going to go through this program in a big old memory diagram. It should take about 50 minutes. Well, a little bit less because I took up some time here. Uh, 40 minutes. It should take exactly 40 minutes. So let's do this. I'll give you a second to look at it. What we're going to do is build a tree. A binary tree, not a binary search tree, just a regular binary tree. Uh, I got rid of the first class function. There was a function that the traversals took. I got rid of that because we don't know how to represent those in the heap. So I'm not going to do that. We're never going to require you to have a function on the heap. Um, so we're going to create this tree. And then we're going to do a post order traversal. The function call comes after both of the recursive calls in our traversal. So we're going to traverse this tree. Build a tree, traverse a tree. And let's just jump into it. So first thing we're going to do, make a constructor call. It's going to create a binary search tree node, which I shortened BSBT node. And I did spell node correctly this time, so we know that that's the right class. Uh, BT node with the value life, null for left, and null for right. Constructor call gets the parameters and this, which is a reference to the object that's being created. Hopefully I said that enough times this semester that that's no surprise to anybody anymore, uh, that you all are familiar with that. And then that creates the object on the heap, because we're using the keyword new, that says we're creating an object on the heap. We get the values from the constructor are going to become state variables. By the way, when we talk about Python, that's one of the big differences. That's something pretty unique to Scala, that the constructor parameters just automatically become state variables. It's something that I like about the language, but makes it a little harder to teach with the language. But it is what it is. And we'll see the difference when we talk about Python. 
Uh, and then we're going to return a reference to that uh, object that was being created. New returns a reference to the object that was created to the value root on the stack. Oh, I have to watch that, that video at some point. OP does dominate industry, by the way. Uh, there's not much functional programming out there. It's starting to become more popular now that distributed systems are pretty ubiquitous, uh, but it's still OOP is very dominant. It's, it's just it's easier to organize your code, I, I think, is the, the TLDR of it. It's easier to work with. Then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say root.left equals some new object. So we're creating another new object on the heap. I'm going to throw this one at OX200 uh, memory address. That has the value Scala, and it's set as the root's left. So I have to follow some references here. Root is the reference 350. Dot means follow the reference to the object. Left, and then replace that. It used to refer to null. Now it refers to this node 200, the node that was created. So this returned a reference to a new node that was created, and we set it as the root's left. Root.left equals the new node that was created. So we're building this tree manually by manipulating our references and replacing those nulls with actual nodes. Do the same thing on the right side. We're going to create another new binary tree node this with the value 4 null null, and then assign that to the root's right. Root dot, follow the reference, right equals the new node that was created. And one more time, we're going to create one another new node that's going to be the root's right. So root dot, follow the reference, right dot, follow the reference left equals the new node that was created, this node having the value coding and then two nulls for its children. So we called the constructor four times. We got four objects on the heap. We got references to those objects. And it ends up building this tree structure that we can see on the slide that I beautifully visualized. So we have our tree, and we're ready to start the traversal. So as I'm messing with my cord here, does anybody have questions about that structure of the tree? I think that's, is, with these nodes, as long as you understand object creation and references, it shouldn't be too overwhelming at that point. But if there are any questions about it, if it's not completely understood at this point, I want to know about it. I want your questions. Because it is still new content. And does everybody see how what's in memory? This isn't required, by the way, for your, uh, for your quizzes. If you draw this, I'm sure nobody's going to get mad at you. Um, but this in memory represents this tree. Does everybody see that connection? Oh, the videos about why OOP is bad. There's so many videos out there about why OOP is bad, and they all do the same thing as Trevor's pointing out. They, they focus on like these very specific things. Like, if I use OOP completely <coughs> inappropriately and in the stupidest way I can think of, it's bad. Like, yeah, don't use it like that. Uh, every video I've seen does that kind of kind of stuff. Uh, just don't fall into those pitfalls. Because uh, if you're going to say OOP is bad, and this is what those videos never do show, not that I wanted to talk about this too much, but what those videos never do show is a suggestion, an alternative idea. Like, there are problems with OOP, but it's, it's one of the best we got. Either OOP or FP. If you're not using one of those, you've got to offer a third suggestion. Yeah? Uh, wait, what does traversal root do again? What is the traversal printing? The traversal root, like the very last line. 
Uh, so the last line is going to take us the rest of the lecture to go through. Oh. It, it's going to take a while. I, I'm just making sure everybody has time to look at the structure of the tree and see what we have so far, because we're about to get into some recursion that has two recursive calls. We're going to have stacks all over the place and references. Uh, I guess not references all over the place. Yeah, references all over the place. I did do my references right. Yeah, references all over the place. Uh, so that's going to take a while to, to go through the traversal. Uh, but that's, I don't know, I, I didn't plan on going down this rant, but uh, it's a common complaint I have about software engineering, software, the whole industry as a whole seems to have this problem of if you're going to pick on something and say something's terrible, you, in my opinion, you have to offer up an alternate suggestion. If you don't offer an alternate suggestion, I'm ignoring your complaints. Uh, and that we see this a lot in the industry. You'll see it a lot more throughout your entire career. People will just love to bash things and tear things apart uh, without building up anything else. So if you can, you can say OOP is bad, but if you're not using OOP, what are you using? Show me a better solution. And if you show me a better solution and you convince me, hey, let's all start using that. But if you're just saying OOP bad, uh, that's not helpful. FP is bad. Well, FP is bad, you can kind of get away with because you can say FP bad, use object-oriented programming. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you need a way to say, here, we'll use OOP, but we still need the benefits of FP, and that's immutable objects. Like, use immutable objects, and you can get away with that. Uh, obviously, this goes a lot deeper than what I'm saying right now, but my general thing of you need to offer a suggestion, an alternative. You see a YouTube video that says OOP's dumb because of XYZ. What are they offering as an alternative? If nothing, they're just ranting. Kind of like I am right now. I'm just ranting. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to listen to me because I didn't offer an alternative to that. Um, all right, everybody ready for this traversal? All right, let's do it. I'm going to try to color code things and, and keep track of all of our stack frames here. So we're going to call this traversal. As always, we're going to start at the root node. So I'm going to call the traversal with the root, which is this reference 350, which is a reference to this object on the heap right here. So our active stack frame is this one right here. It's the stack frame on the top of the stack. Only the top of the stack is active. And the stack is a last in, first out data structure. And that's going to be more important than it has been in the past. It's always important, but it's going to be more important to track where we are in this traversal as we go through this example. So the very first thing that this traversal does is recursively call itself on the node's left child. So we're going to take this node, this 350.left, and make a recursive call on this reference 200 and add that to the stack. We're going to push that to the top of the stack. Bottom visually, but I'll say top because conceptually it's the top of the stack. We're going to push this to the top of the stack and start the process over. Now when we do this, whenever we make a recursive call, the previous, bless you, the previous stack frame is still waiting at this moment. So this stack frame for this reference uh, for 350, which has the value life, so this node right here, is sitting there waiting for its call of traversal of node.left to return. It needs to know where to pick up its execution. It's not enough to just give execution back to this. It needs to know where in that execution, because we're visiting each node multiple times now. The first time we visit it, it's going to make a left recursive call. The second time we visit it, it's going to make a right recursive call. And the third time we visit it, it's going to print its value and then exit that stack frame. So we need to know which of those three situations are we in. And the stack frames have to remember that. Uh, now, they'll remember it with, uh, with function pointers and things that we don't talk about in 116. But visually, we're going to represent it over here by where it is, where its arrow is in this execution. So this arrow for this node is this stack frame right here. And the green one will always be the active one. So we're on this node 200. And it's going to make a recursive call on its left node. Well, its left node is null. Node in this stack frame, node dot left is null. So we're making a recursive call on null. We hit our base case. We don't do anything in this case. Node's null, we hit the else, there is no else, there's no code to run, nothing happens. Nothing happens when we hit null. On 
On test two, I'm seeing this in office hours a little bit when you're uh, in task one, actually. When you, you have to check for null at some point, you have to know when you've reached the end of your list or uh, a tree, actually, no, not in task two. What am I thinking? This is just task one. Uh, you have to know when you hit the end of your list. You have to say, is the next node null? If it is, then I have to treat that as a special case. If you're seeing a null pointer exception, you probably didn't check for null. So we make the recursive call on the left child. It's null. It's the base case returns. Now when we return execution, we're going back to the previous active stack frame. We pop this off of the stack. Whatever the next node that's still alive, the next node that's still, uh, the next stack frame that's still on the stack, that one's now active again. We go back to that one. So we're going back to this frame with OX200. It's right here in its execution. This just returned. So we know that we're ready to go on to this next recursive call and make a recursive call to its right node. Each stack frame is remembering where it is in the execution of this method. It's going to make the right recursive call. We've hit the base case again. And we always put our new stack frames uh, at the, on top of the stack at the bottom visually. I guess I am saying that again. Uh, and it goes below any stack frames that have been removed. So when we cross stack frames out, this stack frame is not on the stack anymore. It doesn't exist in memory anymore. Uh, so we're not erasing our actual stack frames. We just cross them out. That way, when we get your quiz submissions, we know that you trace through all the code. Uh, that's the only reason we just cross them out. But right now, we have the stack frame for the main method, a stack frame for this call of traversal, a stack frame for this call of traversal, and a stack frame for this call of traversal. All the other ones are no longer in memory. They're not in memory at all. Uh, we just visually leave them there and cross them out uh, for our memory diagrams. So we put this frame on the stack. It does nothing. We pop it off of the stack. And now this is on the top of the stack again, this stack frame. So we return execution to this stack frame. This stack frame remembers that it just made its recursive call on its right child. And it knows it's ready for the next line of this code. So it just made this call, and it knows that this is the, since this is the third time we're visiting this stack frame, it knows where, well, not because of that, but it knows where it was, and it knows we're ready to print a value. So we're going to print Scala, we made the two recursive calls, and then visit the node, the value of that node. Both recursive calls, then visit the value, post order traversal. Uh, yeah, it's okay for you to keep drawing the arrows of the recursive calls. I'm not drawing arrows here because I'm returning unit is the reason I don't have arrows here. So I have arrows on my uh, constructor calls because they're returning references to the objects being constructed. I don't have arrows here because I'm not returning anything. I have return type, uh, return type unit. If, uh, if I was returning a value, I would have all my arrows there to show where, uh, where it's returning. Now that I say that out loud, I, ha I should double check with Paul if he does the same thing, if he has recursion that returns null, if, he's, if he has arrows to show what frame it returns to, I guess. That would be redundant, though, because it's just the next active frame, the next frame that's still on the stack. So this one's going to return. We're going to return execution to this frame because it's the next frame on the stack. Pop the top off the stack. Whatever is the next one, that's the current active frame. It is, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can still put your arrows. It, even if it returns unit, you can still put your arrows. I'm just explaining why I'm not here. If this was recursion that returned something, I would definitely have arrows here. I'm just saying why I don't have arrows here. If you return unit and you have your arrows, that's perfectly fine. We're not going to take points off of that for sure. Because uh, you are, as Nicholas points out, you are technically returning unit in a very technical sense. You are returning unit. All right, so we print out that value, return. We're at the end of the method. 
return, there's only one frame still on the stack aside from the main stack frame. So execution returns here. This stack frame remembers that it just made its recursive call to the left. And now it's been waiting a while, but this call with the root node now has its chance to do something again. It made its left recursive call. A bunch of stuff happened. Now it gets its execution back, and it's going to say, I'm going to make a right recursive call. So it's going to make a right recursive call, 350.write. So node is 480. And its first thing it's going to do is make its left recursive call. It's left recursive call, 480 node dot left is 936. So we're going to call traversal of 936. This node, start the method over again. Traversal of node dot left, 936 dot, follow the reference, left is null. And we're going to have a recursive call to null. It's our base case, just returns. Returns back to this node. This node just made its left recursive call. It's going to make its right recursive call. That's also null. But right here, it's our most complex state that we're going to have. So I want to take a time out on this one. At this point, we have four frames on the stack. And they're in, most of them, I guess, are in different, situ, uh, different states, I guess, for lack of a better word. So we have a stack frame for the root node, which is waiting for its call of the right recursive call to return. So whenever it gets its execution back, it's ready to print out its node's value. We have a recursive call on this node, 480, which just made a recursive call on its left node. So whenever it gets control back of the program, whenever it's the active frame, the frame on the top of the stack, it's going to make this right recursive call. It's ready to do that. And then this frame here, 936, it's also waiting at the right node, just like the root node is. So when it gets control back, it's going to print out its node's value and then return. So each frame is remembering where it is in the execution. So when you're drawing your memory diagrams, you don't have to annotate. There's nothing on the memory diagram where you have to say, this stack frame is at this point in the execution. Because when your memory diagram's done, they're all at the end of the execution. So you know, it, there's nothing to, to really annotate. It's a more dynamic thing. But it can help you when you're drawing out, when you're going through the quiz, because you better believe we're going to give you a, a tree to trace through like this on the LO4 quiz. When you're going through that quiz, it can be helpful to somewhere on the side keep track, just for your own purposes, where each stack frame is in the execution, just so you don't lose track of, of what's going on with it. It can be easy to, to lose track. You get back to a certain stack frame, and you're like, wait, did it make its right call, its left call, or what, what are we doing with this, uh, with this frame? Uh, some way to remember where each of them are. Uh, personally, I would put a tick mark. would probably be what i do. Just a little tick. OK. We visited this node once. OK, we visited it again. OK, we visited it again. Once I have three ticks, I know it's time to return. Uh, but however you want to bookkeep that, because it's not part of the memory diagram specifically. Excuse me. I'm doing this with color-coded arrows to remember where each one belongs. But it's, uh, but it's however you want to keep track of that. Just make sure you do keep track, because that'll be uh, really the tricky thing when you're doing these tree traversal memory diagrams, remembering where each one is. And I'm realizing this example will not take 40 minutes. We'll, we'll have to decide how to handle that. Do I have a better answer? Oh, I didn't realize there was a, an actual question. Does the stack also hold some reference to where the method is, like where it is on uh, of left or right or print line? Yes. So there's a function pointer. Uh, 
I brief, just very briefly mentioned this earlier. It's not a 116 topic, so I don't want to dwell on it too much, but each stack frame will have a function pointer, which remembers where it is in the execution. And then when control returns to a stack frame, it'll go to its function pointer, which will be a reference to the memory. Let's see, I have to stretch my memory here to see if I remember. It's going to be a reference to the memory address of the, um, of the, I'm blanking on the word, execution uh, statement, I guess? Instruction. Command, instruction, thank you. Uh, a reference to the memory address of the instruction of the code of where it's currently executing. So it'll go back to that memory address, find that instruction, and then run the next instruction uh, that it needs to run based on that reference. And then when the reference of the function pointer is a return value, it knows that it needs to destroy itself and return a value back to whatever stack frame called it. And that stack frame will pick up, read its function pointer, and then find out where it is in its execution, and then go through like that. So each stack frame does have a little more bookkeeping than what we show in 116. And those function pointers will keep track of that, where it is in the execution. So register RIP, I forget what RIP stands for. I, I use RIP in a different context. Uh, risk instruction pointer. Uh, but it's a pointer that, that points to where in memory, because your actual code itself is going to be stored in memory. It will have memory addresses, and we use those memory addresses to remember. Not your code, but your compiled code. All right, so we have a, so let's pick up our execution. Let's finish this, uh, this traversal. We're going to make that call on the right child. That's null. It returns. We're ready to print. This frame is now active again. It made its right call. It's ready to print. We're going to print coding to the screen. Uh, mind you, I'm using... I don't think we'll do this on the quiz. Hopefully, the, uh, Paul and the TAs don't throw this at you on the, the quiz. Um, but I'm using print instead of print line. If they do and take, uh, don't give you credit, I would definitely override that. Um, but the difference between print and print line, print line will put a new line character at the end of your uh, whatever you print. Print will not add that new line character. So I want to print all these values on one line. So I'm using print instead of print line. So if you're wondering what's going on there. There's no LN right here, no LN. So that's why these are printing on one line. Uh, I've seen, I've taken, I should say, classes where they would get particular on that, and they would take off points for, oh, well, that was actually print, not print line. Oh, fuck, man. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. Um, I'm not going to do that to anyone. So we're going to print that to the screen, return execution to the next stack frame that's still alive. By still alive, I mean these ones aren't on the stack anymore. So we go to the next one that's not crossed out. We return execution to that one. This node remembers that it, was, it just made its left recursive call. So it's ready to make its right recursive call. It's going to make that call, which is null, which is the base case, returns prints its value, returns back to the next frame that's still alive, 350. It just made its right recursive call. We're going to print to the screen, return back to the main method, and our program is over. I vastly underestimated how, overestimated how long that would take. Uh, any questions on any of this? Yeah, instruction pointer. What did I say? Program pointer, or uh, or did I say instruction pointer? I forget what. Function pointer. I said. Uh, which I'll, I'll I'll claim is the same thing. I don't know for sure though. I think I called them function pointers when I was learning it. Memory diagram won't necessarily be post-order traversal. Absolutely right. 
I just wanted, I wanted to choose something that wasn't in order traversal because I already showed you in order traversal. Um, but if you know how to do any traversals, you know how to do all the traversals. So if we give you pre-order on the quiz, like there's no reason for you to not handle that, uh, not be able to do that unless you're just memorizing things. And in that case, we want to know that. If you just memorized one thing, um, we don't want you to get through the quiz. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a more polite way to say that one. Uh, we want you to actually learn these things is the, the key. So it'll be one of the three traversals. Or potentially a BST. Traversal over a BST. I don't know. Anyone have any questions? I don't really want to let you all go 10 minutes early, but I'm not going to hold you hostage either. Um, can you give us hints for task three? I don't know. At this point, I, I know something about students, and I did the same thing as the students. Once there's a hint that you might be able to leave early, everyone checks out. So <laughs> I'm not going to bother answering that question. <laughs> Nobody's going to listen to me anyway. I'll give a hint while, uh, while I have the lecture question up, I suppose. Um, for task three, oh, no. You know what? Test three, I can't even give a hint. Uh, you have to learn graphs next week. You need graphs to do test three. And I haven't talked about graphs yet. But the slides next week, if you look ahead and look at the slides, like I spell it out. Like I'm pretty explicit about how to do test three. The slide, it's one of the tests in the class where I show you exactly how to do it in the slides. And then you have to convert my slides and my explanations into code. So if you look at those slides and watch the lectures from last semester, you'll be able to get test three. But you do need graphs. Right, uh, and once you answer this, you're, you're free to go. Uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you all Monday.